Good evening and welcome to the Wednesday night Bible study here at Calvary Baptist Church. I'm Pastor Chuck and so glad that you decided to join us this evening as we continue our study in the book of Hebrews. Uh, this evening we are going to be looking at Hebrews chapter 12 verses 1 through 17 and we're really going to see two major themes as we move through this piece of the text. We are going to be seeing first the idea of endurance, that we as Christians are called to endure as we live for Christ, uh, as we face persecution, as we try to do our best to honor and serve Jesus, we need to endure and we need to continue to endure all the way till the end. Uh, secondly, we're going to see a theme of discipline and how the fact that we are disciplined in this life um, shows that we belong to God and that a good father disciplines his children. Now, we aren't necessarily speaking of discipline as in, you know, penalty or punishment during this passage, although those elements and those tones kind of do mix in. But really, we're talking about the idea here of, of discipline as in training, discipline as in maturing, discipline as in, you know, as we experience hard times, it disciplines us and makes us even more faithful. So that's the main thrust that we're going to see as we move through the text here this evening. Uh, also, remembering where we came from in chapter 11 is going to be very important because the foundation that was laid in chapter 11 is really going to feed into what we see here in chapter 12. And of course, that foundation was the fact that we have so many examples of faith in the Old Testament that these individuals such as Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, and Moses, and, and all these different figures, and Noah that we saw looking back into chapter 11, that even though they only had a piece of the puzzle, even though they didn't see the full revelation of God, even though they didn't see the promises that God made to them be manifested within their lifetime, they still had faith. They still pursued God, and they still were able to do great things in His name. And so how much more should we do as we have the full revelation of God as given to us in His Holy Word? And also we have the Spirit that indwells us. We have Jesus Christ who has made a better sacrifice than the Old Testament ever could. And so with that foundation kind of in mind, what we're going to see as we move into chapter 12 is that the author of Hebrews gives us a call to endure in our faith and then also gives us encouragement as we face difficult times. And so with all these kind of things floating through our minds, we're going to jump right into the text, starting in Hebrews chapter 12, verse 1. And here the text says, Therefore, since we are surrounded by so great a cloud of witnesses, let us also lay aside every weight and sin which clings so closely, and let us run with endurance the race that is set before us, looking to Jesus, the founder and perfecter of our faith, who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross, despising the shame, and is seated at the right hand of the throne of God. And so here the author of Hebrews makes a call to that great cloud of witnesses. And that great cloud of witnesses, of course, as we mentioned, is, are those Old Testament figures who had such great faith in, in God and such great faith in his promises that they followed through and, and acted in faith as they lived their life. And so the author of Hebrews says, listen, look at that example. And since we have this great cloud of witnesses, we have these wonderful testimonies before us of what it is to live a life of faith, let us also lay aside every weight. You know, you think about a, a runner or a boxer or some kind of athlete and the way that they train. Uh, a lot of times runners will put on weighted vests and weighted anklets as they are running the track to strengthen their muscles, to build their muscles, to get ready for the trial that's ahead. But do you think that any athlete or any runner keeps those weights on him as he goes to run the race? Of course not. That would be ridiculous. No, he takes off the weight so that he can run with the best of his ability. And there is a metaphor being used here equating the weights that a runner might use to sin. And, and what the author of Hebrews is saying is that, listen, just the way that weights make things more difficult, just the way that a weight weighs you down and prevents you from really running to your fullest, sin prevents us from living our best lives as Christians. 
Sin prevents us from being the witness that we can be. Sin prevents us from pursuing God the way that we need to. And so the author of Hebrews here says that, listen, we need to take this sin that clings so closely to us, and we need to lay it aside, and we need to run with endurance the race that is set before us. We need to continue to pursue and continue to endure. You know, there's no point in the Christian life where we're just supposed to like pull off to the side and take it easy. That's not the job of a Christian. We are to endure the race, run it every single day, and and endure because it is difficult. It doesn't just say, we'll go and, and do the race and you'll be fine. It says endure it. There's an implication there that the Christian life is hard, that it's difficult to maintain. And so what do we do when we face those those different hard times? What do we do when we face those difficulties? Well, here the, the scripture tells us that we need to look to Jesus. We need to look to Jesus because he is the founder and perfecter of our faith. And we need to look at his example because what did Jesus do when he faced difficult times? Well, Jesus endured the cross remembering the joy that was before him remembering the redemption of mankind, remembering the saving of souls and and paying for their sins, and the joy that that sat on the other side of that painful trial that he faced. And because he had that eternal viewpoint and because he understood what this was all for, he was able to endure. And Christ endured so much more than we have in this life following him. I mean, Jesus was scourged, he was beaten, he was humiliated, he was crucified. We haven't endured pain and suffering like that, not most of us anyway. And so when we find it difficult to live the Christian life, we are called to look to Jesus and say, wow, look what Jesus did for us. I think so many times as Christians, we focus on the love and the joy and the peace and all the good things that come with being a follower of Jesus, that we forget how much he had to pay to redeem us and to save us. And it would behoove us as Christians to spend a portion of our time every day reflecting on the cost and reflecting on the payment that was made at Calvary so that we could be counted righteous, pure, and holy. And I think that if we really focused on that aspect of our faith, well then the trials that we face in this life, they would seem little in comparison and they would be much easier to endure. And as we move on to the next passage, the the author of Hebrews continues to tell us to consider Jesus and his sacrifice. And we see that as we move on to verse 3. The text here says, Consider him who endured from sinners such hostility against himself, so that you may not grow weary or faint-hearted. In your struggle against sin, you have not yet resisted to the point of shedding your blood. And so here, it's really important what the the grammar of the passage is saying. Because some people like to read this passage and say, Well, consider him who endured from sinners such hostility against himself, so that you may not grow weary. And they kind of put the idea of, well, Jesus suffered so that we won't grow weary. And that's not what the passage is saying. You have to look at where the clauses line up. And so the command here is, consider him. Consider Jesus. The next part that follows is an explanation of who Jesus is. Consider him who endured from sinners such hostility against himself. So that's the explanation of who we are considering. We're considering Jesus. We're considering all he did. And now the next part answers the why we want to consider him. So basically, you could take that explanation out and the sentence would resume or would read, Consider him so that you may not grow weary or faint-hearted. So the whole reason that we consider Christ and the whole reason that we consider what he did and the whole reason we focus so much on Jesus is so that we don't grow weary as we face struggles in life, as we continue to live for Christ, so that we won't become faint-hearted as we face persecution. Because we remembered all that Jesus endured at the hands of sinful people. Now, remember what these people in the book of Hebrews, the the recipients of this letter, remember what they were facing. They were facing persecution. They were facing trials. Earlier, we read about how their, their items were plundered and how they were thrown in prison, and they had sympathy for those who were thrown in prison. Well, these people were under intense persecution. 
And so here the author of Hebrews is telling them that, listen, when you face those times of persecution, consider Jesus. Because guess what? He also suffered at the hands of sinful people. And so when you realize that, hey, there's nothing that we're going through right now that Christ himself didn't go through, it will encourage you. It will strengthen you and will help you to prevent you from going weary. And then the author reminds them that what they have suffered pales in comparison to what Jesus suffered as he paid for our sin. Because the author says in verse 4 that, that your struggle, you have not struggled to the point of shedding your blood. Now, this is very specific to the people of the day. Because we remember the kind of persecution they were facing. Their property was being plundered and taken from them. Some of them were being thrown in prison. There was a lot of social aspects that they were having to struggle with as being Christians, followers of Jesus. But they weren't being executed at this point in history, at least in the area and the region that these people were living, at least not yet. And so he's encouraging them, saying, listen, you haven't suffered the way Christ suffered. You haven't suffered to the point of shedding your blood. And so endure, because Christ endured more. Now, doesn't that seem to describe what we face in the United States here today? You know, we look at the persecution that we have in the U.S., and, and most of the persecution that we face is social in nature. You know, people look at us as being closed-minded. People look at us as being hypocrites. People look at us as being, you know, narrow in our view. Um, but we aren't really facing a lot of systemic persecution, at least not yet. And so whatever persecution we are facing as we live for Jesus, we need to remember that Jesus suffered more. And that as we look to his example, we can say, wow, and in comparison to Christ, in comparison to the beating of his body, in comparison to the abandonment of his people, in comparison to his crucifixion and the shedding of his blood, our persecution is not that bad. And we are blessed beyond measure to be called sons of God. And, and that's actually the point that we're going to see the author of Hebrews begins to jump into next because he is going to be discussing this idea of discipline as we see in verse 5. And here the text reads, And have you forgotten the exhortation that addresses you as sons? My son, do not regard lightly the discipline of the Lord, nor be wary when reproved by him. For the Lord disciplines the one he loves. He chastises every son whom he receives. And so here the author of Hebrews is encouraging them again, saying, listen, as you are disciplined in the Lord, as you experience these trials that build character, as you experience this persecution that builds your faith, as you undergo this discipline of holding firm and enduring, don't you understand that it proves that you are sons of God? It proves that you're part of his family because God disciplines those whom he loves. And in our discipline, we show that we are truly part of his family. And, and we understand that idea and that metaphor as we kind of live through life. You know, I think of, of my kids, and when I think of when they go and they play at a friend's house, or maybe we meet their, some of their friends at a park, or uh, some of their friends come over for a birthday party, or whatever it is, and I will sit there as their father, and you know, sometimes you see other children doing things that you would never permit your kids to do, and that just happens. You know, every parent has had that experience. They go to a party, or they go to a function, or they go somewhere, and they see other kids running around doing something in a moment, and they think well, that that's not something their children are allowed to do. Now, when my kids jump in and begin to partake in that activity, uh, who do I call for? You know, I don't call for the other kids in the room. I don't call for every other kid to come and sit down in front of me and I give them all an explanation of why that's not appropriate and why we don't do that in this place. No. You know who I call? I call my kids. And I bring them forward. And in that moment, I train them to say, we don't act this way in this setting. This is not the time or place for that. And you should know better. We've had these discuss. I have that discussion with my kids. Why? Because they are mine. I don't discipline someone else's children discipline my children. And so what the author of Hebrews is saying here is that, listen, because we experience discipline from the Lord, because he puts situations in our lives that are difficult, that are trying, that are hard to shape us, to mold us, to change us, it proves that we are sons and daughters of the King. 
it proves that we belong in his family. And he's going to pick up on this, this whole idea even more so as we move into verse 7. Because here the text says, It is for discipline that you have to endure. God is treating you as sons. For what son is there whom his father does not discipline? If you are left without discipline, in which all have participated, then you are illegitimate children and not sons. Besides this, we have had earthly fathers who disciplined us, and we respected them. Shall we not much more be subject to the Father of spirits and live? For they disciplined us for a short time, as it seemed best to them. But he disciplines us for our good, that we may share his holiness. For the moment, all discipline seems painful rather than pleasant, but later it yields the peaceful fruit of righteousness to those who have been trained by it. So we have an example here that all of us can relate to. I mean, I I remember one time being in high school. um, My sister and I did not have a lot of rules when we were growing up. Uh, Maybe my mom thought we were trustworthy. Um, Maybe that, you know, she just kind of saw we were good kids. Uh, I don't know what the motive was, but we didn't have a lot of rules growing up. And that being a part of my life, I didn't really have much of a curfew. And I remember one time uh, I got home probably about 3 o'clock in the morning after hanging out with some of my friends. And as I came home, I woke my mom up as I was coming in, and I remember us having just the oddest conversation. She sat there and she was like, Chuck, it's really late. And you're getting home really late. And I said, yeah. And she's like, well, I don't, I don't know if you should be out that late. And I remember standing there saying, okay, I'm really sorry. What time do you want me home? And she sat there and said, I, I, I don't know, but just this is really late. And it was this odd conversation because there wasn't really discipline going on. There was just kind of this expression of, uh, of what she wanted. And I was trying to figure out what my mom wanted, but there wasn't ever a clear line. And that actually led us to have a conversation where I remember looking at my mom and I remember saying, will you please just tell me what you want me to do? Would you give me some rules? Would you give me some boundaries so that I can follow them? And there was this desperate desire within me for my mom to look at me and say, this is how you're going to live, this is how you're going to act, and this is what I expect of you. And and outside of that, man, I, I just don't know what it was, but there was some part of me that understood that loving parents discipline their children. And, 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 you know, as we were growing up, yeah, we had rules. We just didn't have a lot of them. But there was just this part, this kind of struggle, this conflict of, I want to please you. Please show me how. And we understand and we know that loving parents discipline their kids. I discipline my kids. Uh, we have our two-year-old, Lily, right now, and she kind of rules the house. She rules the roost amongst her brother and her sisters. And there are times when we have to discipline that little girl. And we have to take her and say, hey, the way you're talking is not nice. My son is turning into a teenager at this point in our lives. And in a couple of years, that's where he's going to be. And we're starting to see some of that aggression, some of that arrogance, some of those things that come with adolescence. And we are training him. We are disciplining him to tell him, you know, when you speak to your sisters, you speak with kindness. I know it's frustrating having three sisters in the house, but you need to treat them with love and kindness. You're stronger than them. You need to remember that in the way that you play with them. You're older and wiser than them. You need to remember that when they do silly things that drive you crazy. And we have to train him. And why do we do that? Because we love him. And so if we understand this from our earthly fathers, well, then of course we should understand it from God. And his discipline is better. And we see that in the scripture because our earthly parents, they discipline us doing the very best they can. And I'm sure that I have made so many mistakes disciplining my kids, but my heart was in the right place as I did it. But we know that God is better because he doesn't discipline us just because he thinks it might be good. No, he knows what's good for us. And he knows that his discipline leads to righteousness and holiness in our lives. And even though discipline doesn't feel good in the moment, we know that it's going to develop these good characteristics in us. And God does it. And God does it for our good. Why? Because he's a loving father and he is a kind father. And so then the the author of Hebrews kind of begins to wrap up this argument in verse 12. He starts with the word, therefore. And so that means we've got to consider everything that we have talked about. 
So because God is a loving Father, because the discipline we receive from the Lord is for our benefit, because we, we know that He wants good things for us and He wants us to be righteous and He wants us to be holy, because we know that the end result of discipline is holiness and righteousness and a peaceful life, because we know that, we're now going to be called to do something as we move into verse 12. And the text says, Therefore, lift your drooping hands and strengthen your weak knees and make straight paths for your feet so that what is lame may not be put out of joint but rather be healed. Strive for peace with everyone and for the holiness without which no one will see the Lord. See to it that no one fails to obtain the grace of God that no root of bitterness springs up and causes trouble, and by it many become defiled, that no one is sexually immoral or unholy like Esau, who sold his birthright for a single meal. For you know that afterward, when he desired to inherit the blessing, he was rejected, for he found no chance to repent, though he sought it with tears. So because we know that discipline is good for us. And because we know that God is a loving Father, what are we called to do? We are called to lift our drooping hands and strengthen our weak knees. That idea of strengthening your weak knees, that's an idiom that means to stand firm, to stand steadfast. Don't waver. Because remember what these people were experiencing. They were experiencing persecution. And the Lord was using that persecution as discipline to shape them and mold them and train them up. And so what the author of Hebrews is saying, hey, you understand what this persecution's for. You understand what these bad times are for. You understand that the Lord is disciplining you to increase your faith. So stand firm in it. Don't waver from one side to the other. Don't, don't shift back and forth. Stand firm in your faith because you understand the process taking place within you. Do you see how understanding why something's happening changes your perspective? Because if you just thought, man, God's really mean, he hates me, he's abandoned me, he's left me to, to all of these experiences and all these trials and all this pain to suffer on my own, well then, yeah, you might just sit there and say, I give up. And you might just lay back and say, whatever, let the world do what it wants to do, I'm just done. Oh, but when you understand that God loves you and that he cares for you and that he's allowing these things to happen in your life to strengthen you, to build righteousness into you and to build you up, well, then you can say, okay, I understand why this is happening. I understand what the purpose of this is. I get, I get it. And so, yes, I will endure. I will lift my drooping hands. I won't just sit back and let it happen, but I will lift my hands and be ready to fight the good fight. I will strengthen my knees, and I will stand firm on the foundation of Jesus Christ. And in doing that, what are we called to do? We're called to live peacefully with those around us. We're called to live lives of holiness. And it's interesting here because the text says, and for the holiness without which no one will see the Lord. If we are not living holy lives set apart for God, then those we come in contact can never see Christ in us. And then <laughs> they'll never come to Jesus for salvation because we are the vessels by which God has chosen to present the gospel to his elect. And we do so by the preaching of the word, and we do so by holy, godly living. And, and we're given this very interesting comparison at the end to Esau. It says, don't be sexually immoral or, or, or unholy like Esau, who sold his birthright for a single meal and then regretted it afterwards. And see, when you go back and you study Esau, what you find is that looking back at Esau in the book of Genesis, that, that he was a man who was completely secular. He did not care for the things of God. He did not care for his birthright. He did not care for his inheritance. He did not care about being the chosen son who would carry on the lineage. Those things were not important to him. And so God passed them on to Jacob. Jacob is the one who took up that mantle. And, and from the beginning, God preordained that to take place, and God chose Jacob so that his sovereign purpose of election might continue. But the, the, cha the, the warning here is don't be like Esau. We need to hold the things of God in great esteem. We need to hold the things of God in great value. And we need to make sure that we live holy lives before him. 
And so I hope that you are encouraged this evening that no matter what painful trials you're experiencing, no matter what persecution you may be going through, understand that God's using that in your life. God cares about you. He hasn't abandoned you. He hasn't left you alone by, by any stretch of the imagination. But He is taking these trials. And the Scripture says that we need to endure them so that it can produce righteousness and peace within us. And it's just like it says in the book of James that we should count it joy as we face the trials of various kinds. Why? Because we know the end. We know the result. And we know the purpose for which we go through those sufferings and we go through those trials. And in moments of weakness when we don't think we're going to make it, we need to look to Jesus. We need to remember what he suffered and remember what he endured. And that will give us hope and that will give us encouragement that we too can endure till the end when we see him face to face. I hope this evening has been a blessing to you. I hope that it has been encouraging to you to hear how we are to endure and to hear how God disciplines us because he loves us. And I hope you've had a wonderful time this evening. God bless.